Cooper Wingert has written 10 books. And I guess that's easy to do now that he's in his uh, late 40s. Uh, 10 books, including The Confederate Approach to Harrisburg, which won the 2012 Dr. James Robertson Literary Award for Confederate History. His other works include Harrisburg in the Civil War, 2013, Emergency Men, 2013, and most recently, the subject of tonight's talk, Slavery in the Underground Railroad in South Central Pennsylvania. Cooper is a student at Dickinson College and lives in downtown Carlisle, and uh, we're very grateful that Cooper is spending some time with us tonight, and uh, I ask him to come up and start his presentation. Can we have a round of applause for Cooper? Hear me all right? In the back? Can you hear me in the back? That's all right, move this up a little bit. I also want to thank John Fralish because when I was doing the research for this book, I used a lot of the abstracts that he had compiled. So um, it saved me a lot of time. So I appreciate that. Um, well, well deserved. So when I started out to write this book, I wanted to tell the story of slavery in Pennsylvania. Uh, going back to the colonial times. But that's kind of hard to sell to a publisher because that's kind of a gloomy story. So we ended up combining it with the aspect of the Underground Railroad. And I learned things that I did not know at the outside of this book was that this region, where I define as South Central Pennsylvania, is the area west of the Susquehanna River and east of the Blue Ridge Mountains. So Cumberland, Franklin, York, and Adams County. Don't worry, I will have some maps to further explain that uh, in, the, in the presentation. But in these four counties, this little geographic area of Pennsylvania, there was a very, um, it, was, it began and originated as a very distinct region which had more slaves than any other part of Pennsylvania. And as slavery slowly died out in Pennsylvania, it becomes, because of that same <laughs> geography, the one of the most frequently used underground railroad networks anywhere in America. So it, it was a book that, um, you know, the, books, the book kind of is divided in two parts. You have one, one part that tells the story of slavery, the second that tells the story of the Underground Railroad. But they link together and they mix and they overlap a great deal. So transatlantic slavery, um, we, you all know the story of this. People had been, or I should say Westerners, Europeans, had been, had been enslaving Africans going back to the 1100s. Um, and that first began, obviously, well before the New World was discovered, with people uh, in mainland Europe enslaving Africans in a Mediterranean trade. They would work on plantations and islands like Sicily. But with the discovery of the New World, this old in institution of slavery is compounded into a huge um, new commercial market. When Philadelphia is first founded around six, in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia in 1680, um, one of the first um, shipments of slaves that is brought to the city, when there's only 2,000 people in Philadelphia, uh, 150 African slaves are sold almost immediately when they arrive in Philadelphia. Uh, the Quakers, who um, later became you know, synonymous with abolitionism, were at the beginning of the, you know, at the, beginning of the colony of Pennsylvania, um, the largest slaveholders in Pennsylvania because they were the majority of people in Pennsylvania at that early time. Quakers had very strong contacts with Barbados. Uh, a lot of Quaker missionaries sailed from Philadelphia all the way down to Barbados. And there they converted a lot of white plantation owners to become Quakers. Those plantation owners owned a lot of slaves. So Quakers in Philadelphia who may have owned only a couple slaves would not speak out against slavery because their converts in Barbados were huge slaveholders. You didn't want to anger uh, your constituency. So, so Pennsylvania, all 13 colonies had slaves, but Pennsylvania um, you know, this is not a free state beginning. It has, there are many slaves. There are hundreds and thousands, hundreds at first, and then uh, by the early 1700s, there are several thousand slaves living in, in Pennsylvania, alongside white indentured servants. Here are some pictures of slavery in Philadelphia, and I, believe me, this is uh, Philadelphia is more a brief 
um, prelude to this talk, kind of explaining how the colony grew. The most majority of the talk will be out here in South Central Pennsylvania. So here um, we have we have the London Coffee House, which was a famous um, the London Coffee House, a very famous slave market. Uh, this is a 17 teens, uh, 1720s. We're talking in Philadelphia. Here's an advertisement for at the, at the London Coffee House, the engraving giving a scene of kind of a motley discussion, bartering, uh, whatever you want to call it at the London Coffee House. But it gives you an idea that slavery was an institution in Philadelphia uh, very early on, and that it was you know, much like in the South, but on a smaller scale. Re the, reason the reason Pennsylvania did not become a major slave state was because of our climate. And we did not have the, um, the climate that enabled southern states like Virginia and South Carolina, even Maryland, to grow large amounts of a staple crop that demanded so much labor. So most Pennsylvania slave owners owned one, two, three slaves. Some of them who were very wealthy owned a dozen slaves, but you don't see many beyond um, a dozen slaves. So I talked about this area that I, I kind of focus on in this book. So west of the Susquehanna River, so we're here in Carlisle, east of the Blue Ridge Mountains. So this kind of corner of Pennsylvania. And as you see, it is pretty geographically unique. Um, so what we can review here, in 1749, York County is carved out everything south of the South Mountains. So we're talking modern day Adams County and York County. In 1750, Cumberland County goes all the way down to the Maryland border. It is uh, the Cumberland Valley. It also goes way out to the west and to the north. Uh, it goes to a lot of places, but for the purposes of this talk and for the book, I focused on the Cumberland Valley. So you'll hear me use those terms interchangeably. Uh, eventually, Cumberland County is cropped down to the size we know it today, and Franklin County is formed. But from 1750 until 1784, this is all one county, all Cumberland plus some out here at the west. But the figures I will use for slave holding in Cumberland County are, are modified so they only include Cumberland Valley townships because that is kind of the geographic area I was focusing on. So I should I'll delve a little more into geography. So if you are a farmer in south central Pennsylvania, this area does not begin to get settled in, in uh, large numbers until the 1730s and 40s, and eventually in the 1750s, these counties are created as a result of the migration. If you are a farmer in, let's say, near Carlisle, or even, let's even use the example, near, near Chambersburg, are you going to send your goods all the way up on the road, risk them, because there's no bridge across the Susquehanna until 1812, and risk them on a ferry across the river, or a uh, flat across the river? A lot of farmers did not. A lot of farmers opted to take their goods down the valley. Or if you lived in the Gettysburg, Hanover, York area, what would become those areas, you might take your goods south to Baltimore. There was a road that went straight from these areas southeast to Baltimore. So early on, this area formed connections far more with the South, being, being Hagerstown, um, Baltimore, uh, Winchester, Shenandoah Valley, than it did with uh, Philadelphia. And that shows in architecture, it shows in furniture, uh, that was uh, the styles that were used in this area, <laughs> this area of Pennsylvania versus Lancaster County and Eastward. This area was much more distinctly southern in a lot of aspects because of this geography. And that starts from the beginning of the settlement here. So here are a couple of um, things that were gleaned from rec that I gleaned from some of the, a variety of different records, government and personal accounts. Um, so here are some of the early slaveholders of Cumberland Valley. These are the larger ones. As I said, most people uh, in, Cum in Cumberland Valley and um, what was then York County owned one or two slaves. But here are some of the larger slaveholders. You have Philip Davis and Peters Township, which is way down here. He had um, seven slaves, and one of the, this is one of the earliest manumission, mentions of manumission I've ever seen uh, in this area. From 1753 in his will, he decides that his um, slave Mary would be willed to his wife Sarah, and further instructions that upon Sarah's death, Mary was to either be willed to a grandchild or else to set her altogether free. Another slave owner who was not quite as benevolent was Henry Pauling in Antrim Township, which is also south of uh, Chambersburg. It's near what we now know as Greencastle. He had eight slaves, 
on his 657 acre plantation. This is 1763. Um, he recorded in his in estate inventory upon his death a bed for the Negroes valued at a mere 15 shillings compared to the beds used by the Pauling family that were valued as much as six pounds and uh, 10 shillings. And this bed is also listed in among the order of things in the kitchen. So it is likely that his eight slaves slept on some very crude bed in a kitchen. So it gives you an ex it, you can with three, these um, kind of emotionless government documents, you can glean a story out of how these people lived. Uh, here is a actual artifact from the area. Um, I like what uh, my friend Craig uses for the title for this, a working irritation device. Uh, it was kind of one of those things when you're wearing it, it would continually remind you of that status that was the, the goal of the slave owner to enforce. Here is a document that actually came from the Cumberland County uh, Historical Society archives. This is Robert Whitehill. How many here, here have heard of Robert Whitehill? Okay, because I, I ask that at a lot of talks, and usually one person raises their hand. So I'm glad we got more than one. Robert Whitehill was very influential. He was actually the representative for Cumberland County in the state legislature in 1776 in Philadelphia. So he was there when they were signing the declaration, but he wasn't in that Congress. He was in the little Congress that was the state. They were drafting something called the 1776, 1776 Pennsylvania State Constitution. Well, the Declaration of Independence is being debated. So Robert Whitehill, um, this is several years before, in 1770, he lives in East Pennsboro Township. His home is actually still standing. Uh, it's now a funeral home in Camp Hill, uh, right next to the Pennsylvania Bakery. <laughs> so that's where Robert Whitehill lives, and he is one, uh, not only is he a big supporter of the Declaration, he doesn't sign it, but he's a supporter, frames the 1777, 1776 state constitution, He's also the author of an early draft of the Bill of Rights, uh, an influential dissent. And, but here he is in 1770, um, paying 70 pounds in full for one Negro boy named Paco. So it gives you an idea that, um, you know, this, this is the only slave that we know he owned during his lifetime, but it gives you an idea of that double standard of, and, and this is how life was in this area during those times. Here's one of the more interesting pieces. This is written by James Hamilton. He is seeking, this is 1788, it's printed by Klein and Reynolds, which were the primary printers in Carlisle during the 1780s. And he is seeking a runaway slave to be returned. Now this man would have been very distinctive if you had met him on the road because he spoke with a Northern Irish accent. Um, so he would not have been someone who was easy to, um, to disguise himself among the population. Uh, but here is an early example of a um, handbill that was printed in Cumberland County. So slave population by township. Uh, John Heiser, who was a park ranger at Gettysburg, I commissioned to do some maps. He's an excellent cartographer. And he did these maps by township uh, in 1780. So what happens in 1780 is we have slavery um, in the Philadelphia area and Lancaster, everywhere east of the Susquehanna River. Slavery is almost non-existent by the time of the American Revolution. Uh, the Quakers, who initially were um, slaveholders themselves, have turned around, and by 1774, the Quakers banned slaveholding. You cannot hold slaves and be a Quaker. The Quakers were the first religious group in America to do that. Uh, so they came pretty early to the game. You know, most other religious groups, is, you know, had split dominate the nominations, but um, going into, up until the Civil War, uh, there were very few bans, outright bans on slaveholding. So the Quakers um, in, you know, there's some Quakers here, but the majority of them in, in uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, they've done away with slaveholding. Others, other groups have very few, if any, slaves. They're slowly phasing them out. Uh, but here in South Central Pennsylvania, where the region has been settled more recently, slavery is at its peak. And when the Revolutionary War starts, uh, a lot of the men, a lot of the sons who were working farms here in South Central Pennsylvania go off to war. As a result, uh, in 1776, 1777, and 1778, uh, a lot of people in Cumberland, Cumberland, Franklin, York, and Adams counties, what we now know as those four counties, buy slaves because they need people to work their farms. White indentured servants are going off and running into the army. 
So they use slave labor. Presumably they bought a lot of it from Maryland nearby or Virginia, which, was, which then bordered Pennsylvania. So you, you see this dramatic spike in slaveholding in right, right after the break of the revolution. And it corresponds with all, a lot of these men leaving their farms to go fight the revolution. So somebody has to help work the farms. So that's kind of how slavery is rejuvenated in this area of Pennsylvania, not to the east. Um, so in 1780, the state of Pennsylvania, the legislature in Philadelphia, takes up the question to abolish slavery. Now remember, at this time, Philadelphia is still the capital. This area here, we are the frontier. Nobody really, you know, is, is too worried about what we think. So they decide to pass an abolition. They don't have slaves anymore. It doesn't seem important to them, so let's get rid of it. So they pass a legislative abolition, uh, a bill called for the gradual abolition of slavery. Bill did not free a single slave for 28 years. It said that if you were a slave born after the passage of the act, you would be free at the age of 28. So 1808 would be the first slave who was free. If you were a slave before the passage of the act, then you were born too early and you would be a slave for life. So this bill literally cut families in half. You'd have a mother who was a slave for life her eldest son was born in 1779, he was a slave for life, and her youngest son was born in 1780, he, had, he would be free at age 28. So it literally split families in half. Uh, but you can see here in 1780, there was a great deal of slaveholding throughout the county. Uh, Peters Township, Antrim Township, both, both have over 100, Carlisle 69. So as slavery is dying off and Philadelphia is passing this bill, it's still alive here. However, it doesn't just vanish overnight. It is a long, protracted process. And we still have slaves in Cumberland County um, into the 18-teens, uh, even into the 1840s, but in very small numbers. So here was, um, with the gradual abolition bill, you had to register your slaves. This meant that you were going to uh, take a horse ride into this county seat, which for even people in Chambersburg area was Carlisle. And you'd register your slaves, you'd provide their names, their gender, and their age. So you can see here, this was a man from Hopewell Township, and he registered his slaves, uh, their age, gender, uh, and that was his way of his staking his claim, uh, that is, as long as he properly registered his property, uh, they would be his for the duration of their life, or if they were born after the act, for the duration of uh, their 28 years of term slavery. Here's another one, this is from Antrim Township. And I'm happy to put these up later at the end if any of you want to look at these in detail. This is York County, so to give you an idea, so Adams County, this is the split here. This is Adams County, Cumberland, or Gettysburg is right around here, was not yet formed at the time. Has similar slaveholding, mostly in the southwest corner, Hamilton Bay and Township has 100, 104 slaves. Cumberland, which is where Gettysburg is today, has 62. Now, as I said, slavery has a very protracted life here, and the first slave isn't freed until 1808 by that act. So we look at 1810, and you still have uh, close to 300 slaves living in Cumberland County. At the peak, um, this area of Pennsylvania as a whole, all four counties as we know them today, had well over 1,000 slaves. Um, and when you compare that to the populations of the time, it's a pretty significant force, um, part of the workforce. When I studied um, the occupations of the people who owned the slaves, which gives you an idea of what the slaves did themselves, 71% were agricultural. So most of them were working at farms. There were some who worked as uh, um, workers in iron foundries. So a lot of them did blacksmith work. Uh, others were um, op helped to operate taverns. So they did a wide variety of uh, work in Cumberland County. So shifting to the second part of the talk, so slavery, as I said, it's this very slow, gradual death. In the 18 teens, because each successive year another generation of slaves is being freed by the law, um, slavery begins to die out very quickly from 1810 to 1820. It's almost, it's effectively extinct by the mid-1820s in this area, but there are still a few that linger on. Uh, meanwhile, to the south of us in Adams County is this very, this birth of a very strong, and when you compare it to others on the national stage, it's a very vocal abolitionist movement. 
and it spreads throughout this whole area of South Central Pennsylvania. It really is, for, it, the crux of it begins in Northern Adams County. So if you're going south on 34 from Carlisle, you get into what we now know as apple country, uh, the big beautiful apple orchards. This is where this abolitionist movement really took root, going back to the 1790s. It was an area settled by Quakers. Uh, they had been helping slaves infrequently for many years. Uh, but in the 1820s, they start to go to the newspapers and they start to make declarations. But usually they don't follow it up. They're a little um, inconsistent and disorganized in that sense. Uh, but in 1836, uh, there's a big election coming up. Andrew Jackson is retiring from the, pre retiring from the presidency uh, and the man who's running for the presidency is Martin Van Buren, who's from New York, but uh, the condition of national politics at that time is such that Van Buren is frightened to death of being called an abolitionist. He does so many things to conciliate the South and to say he's a friend of slavery. Uh, so these, these men in Adams County really felt compelled to speak up, and this is a diverse group of Quakers from northern Adams County, also some Lutherans and Presbyterians from Gettysburg and the surrounding farm fields, all met at a place called McAllister's Mill, which is actually part of the battlefield today, on July 4th, 1836, and the group proceeded to unanimously adopt 14 resolutions. They began with a statement that we receive as a divine truth the declaration made by St. Paul that God has made of one blood all nations of men. There are a number of uh, resolutions. There's 14 in total. I'll just read a couple of the ones. You get the idea of what their goals were. So here is uh, resolve that if the liberty is, liberty is the right of all men, no human being can rightfully be held in slavery. And here is really where they're going. So they're declaring these principles and it was, it was a very rare thing to declare such things uh, in a local newspaper in 1836. You know, abolitionism was still the fringe of society. They were kind of the people you pointed at and called nut jobs. Um, they were not mainstream. It was not, it, was not, um, it was not a chic thing to be an abolitionist. So here's what they write. That although we may be denounced for our efforts in the cause of human rights by office-holding and office-seeking politicians, and even by men wearing clerical robes, we will not be afraid of their terror. But disregarding their denunciations, we will continue to open our mouths for the dumb and to plead the cause of the oppressed and of those who have none to help them, humbly believing that if we do unto others as we wish they would do unto us, we shall have the approbation of him which will render to every man according to his works and whose approbation will be a full remuneration for the loss of this world's favor. So these were men, uh, as I said, of a very diverse background, white and black, uh, all different faiths, who came together. Um, you know, some of them lived in town, some of them worked on farms, some of them were craftsmen, some of them were professors, uh, who came together in support of this cause, and they came out quite publicly. They published their names in the newspaper. And when you come out publicly, sometimes things go wrong. They met again in September, that went pretty well, on Constitution Day. Then they met in December in Gettysburg in the courthouse. And the pro-slavery forces uh, had a surprise for them. They crowded the courthouse, and when the abolitionists came in, they began to hurl things at them. Rotten eggs, even a dead cat was thrown at the abolitionists. So they were not well received, and they were forced to um, evacuate literally this uh, the premises of the Gettysburg Courthouse, go into a, a secluded schoolroom, and sign a Declaration of Sentiments and form their society, which became the Adams County Anti-Slavery Society. So I'll go through a couple of the key players in the Underground Railroad because these people who are speaking out about abolition, by and large, were the same people who were um, doing these covert. Um, which was against the law to help fugitive slaves who were on their way north. James McAllister lived, this is where the first meeting was held, right off the Baltimore Pike, Route 97, just southeast of Gettysburg. It's on what we now know as Culp's Hill, part of the Gettysburg battlefield. Uh, he was a very frequent stop in the Underground Railroad. So to give you an idea, here's a general map. I'll be coming back to this a lot. McAllister is here, so we're here in Carlisle to orient to. As you see, that geography, if you're, if you're a runaway slave and you're on your own, you're not, probably not going to cross the mountains on your own without guidance. You're also not going to cross the river on your own without guidance because you need a bridge. So you're kind of funneled up 
in this area of South Central Pennsylvania, often through Cumberland County to get to Harrisburg, which was relatively safer compared to this area uh, with the slave catchers. So McAllister had a number of friends, and this is how the Underground Railroad operated, is there was not a point A, point B. Not everyone was led to freedom by Harriet Tubman. That would have been nice, but it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't the case. And usually, uh, you, if you were a runaway slave, you had an idea that North was free, but you did not even know where your first stop was most of the time. You were got kind of going blind, and you hoped that you would uh, you know, run into somebody sympathetic, or you would um, find somebody who would help you along the way, or at least point you in the right direction. And a lot of times you didn't. A lot of times you found the exact opposite, and you were uh, back, on, back where you, you know, had fled from within a few days. So the way the Underground Railroad works is you have several abolitionists within the same area. They uh, cocoon themselves in, they kind of cluster together. So, so we have a network, all, the first network here. So if you're coming up from Eastern Maryland, Baltimore area, you're coming up towards Gettysburg, you had, you first house you would hit was the Wirt House. They were abolitionists. <coughs> then you would hit the Hewitland House. And then right up from the road from that was the McAllisters. So you have three abolitionist families along the same road within what, a half mile of each other? So if the slave catchers are banging on word, the word store, the slaves could be shifted to uh, the Hewitland House or the McAllister House uh, um, to, to buy time. So you had these very close-knit uh, communities who would not tell on each other uh, and who would help each other along. So that's one community of many just southeast of Gettysburg. Uh, when you got up to Northern Adams County, the York Springs area, you had a number of Quaker families who were very, by and large, involved in the Underground Railroad, um, you know, more disproportionately than any other faith, uh, because they were so closely located to each other. And once you get, got into Quaker Valley, uh, there was, you could hardly find a soul who was going to report you. Uh, even if somebody was a Quaker and not actively on the Underground Railroad, uh, a lot of Quakers considered it was uh, against their religion to report a fellow Quaker for following his conscience, even if he was breaking the law. So wh when you got into these communities, that was where the safety was found and the strength of, in the strength of like-minded people. Uh, and you see this all throughout um, South Central Pennsylvania. Like you see uh, southwest of Carlisle, there were two abolitionists who lived right next to each other, um, so Morrison and Woods. So you have these, uh, or even I'll, I'll go and I'll, I'm going to cover him in a little bit. But uh, uh, Kaufman, who was in uh, Boiling Springs, he had four, uh, four or five neighbors and family members who were living within a mile or two of him that frequently led un, led fugitive slaves to his property in Boiling Springs. So that was how how this operated. Was a lot a lot of it was through kinship. A lot of it was through um, neighbors who shared your sentiments. William and Phoebe Wright were probably, uh, and you look at the uh, United States as a whole, probably two of the most influential Underground Railroad conductors anywhere in the United States. Uh, according to one of the early historians of the Underground Railroad who uh, worked and wrote in the 1870s and 1880s, they helped over a thousand slaves to freedom uh, during their 40 odd years on the Underground Railroad. They actually had a house right here on 34, but that wasn't good enough. So they moved to York Springs, which is near route, what we now know as Business Route 15, and they built a house in 1840 specifically designed for the Underground Railroad. It has more windows and doors than any house you've ever seen. It has several doors on each side of the house, it even has a door on the second story with a staircase, an outdoor staircase leading from the second story to the, to the grass below. Uh, if this would, this would be the, a fire inspector's dream house. I mean, there was every single which way you could escape. Um, you know, so, so clearly this was, a, this was a design. These were very dedicated people to actually build their house to conform to this underground, um, you know, network. So they were very bold, and they often had slave catchers at their house. When a slave catcher was seeking a runaway slave, they usually just showed up at Wright's house and figured sooner or later the runaway slave would appear. But the Wrights had considerable experience. Uh, they even had a down drill. Um, one time a slave catcher came up and saw the two slaves he was seeking. 
So William Wright said, let them go inside and get their coats. So they did. Meanwhile, Phoebe Wright emerges with a Bible. She gives them a teeth-chattering 30-minute Bible lecture on the evils of slaveholding. At the end of the lecture, they realize the slaves are nowhere to be seen. And they were furious with William Wright. And he said, nobody forced you to listen. So they, they did this routinely. They were very skilled in eva evasion, and they knew how they knew the intricacies of the law because uh, start before that it was illegal to harbor slaves, but especially after 1850, those penalties were ramped up uh, significantly. And uh, you have Daniel Kaufman even before 1850, um, you know, was fined over five thousand dollars, which you can imagine in today's money for uh, harboring 13 fugitive slaves. One of the people who came through the Wright's property was James Pennington. He was from the eastern shore of Maryland. He fled his plantation. He didn't know where he was going. He was caught several times by slave catchers on the way up. And uh, one time he was being particularly ingenious and he told them that he had just come from a gang of slaves that had smallpox. They left him alone. <laughs> so he finds himself at the door of William Wright William Wright uh, gives him a job uh, cutting wood, uh, stacking cords of wood for the winter. It's November, so they needed that. And he teaches James Pennington to read and write in six months. James becomes the first black graduate of Yale, later becomes a doctor of divinity and teaches in Germany. So he's a product of our local uh, Underground Railroad. And he was in correspondence with the Wrights. They formed lifelong friendships. He was in correspondence with the Wrights. Uh, so he came through here in 1828. And in the 1840s, he wrote a book, which is I highly recommend it, one of the best written books um, about any subject on his experiences on the Underground Railroad. And he wrote it in 1849, when the Wrights were still active on the Underground Railroad. So he abbreviates their name as WW and PW in his book. Um, and he even includes a piece of correspondence from them talking about some of the Underground Railroad activity they had been doing recently. So he, you know, he kept close contact with the people he met here in South Central PA. So Thaddeus Stevens, how many here are familiar with Thaddeus Stevens? Okay, a lot of people. We got more than Robert Whitehill. <laughs> so for whatever that's worth. So Thaddeus Stevens was a, he came to Gettysburg as a lawyer in the eight, around 1817 and he was from Vermont. And he becomes an abolitionist after, um, after a few years. He's clearly an abolitionist. And he has interesting ways of getting things accomplished. He understands kind of the art of politics, whereas instead of making declarations, he positions himself. He is on the board of the bank, the only bank in Gettysburg. In, in your mortgage, when you were a farmer and you had a mortgage from the bank in Gettysburg, it was written in that um, your mortgage could be recalled at, at, a, at the discretion of the bank. Being the president and the board of directors of the bank, if you reported Underground Railroad activity, the discretion of recalling your mortgage would fell to Thaddeus Stevens. So your entire farm payment could be due within a matter of days if you forgot to remain silent. So it, it encouraged uh, amnesia. He also sat on the board of Pennsylvania College. He chartered, he was one of the people who helped get the charter through. Pennsylvania College hires a black janitor by the name of Jack Hopkins, who is a prolific Underground Railroad conductor for years. But it gets more interesting. Thaddeus Stevens is also a personal property owner. Uh, has anybody seen the news reports about Lee's headquarters being reopened? Well, it was, that building was owned by Thaddeus Stevens <coughs> for many years. Uh, and he had people who lived in it, tenant, tenant, pe tenants. Um, Thaddeus Stevens, as state legislator for Gettysburg, commissions this big railroad cut that runs from Gettysburg, from that house that he owned, all the way out to Caledonia Ironworks. I should have a map here. So from Gettysburg, from the house he owns, to Caledonia Ironworks, which he also owns. Caledonia Ironworks was also known as Little Africa. There were over a hundred fugitive slaves living at Caledonia, and he paid them and they worked. So fugitive slaves coming up the mountain from Rousersville, the west slopes of the South Mountain, they'd get to Caledonia, and if they wanted to go on, they would walk the railroad cut because the tracks were never laid. So from the 1830s up until the Battle of Gettysburg, 
there was just this big straight cut that led straight from Caledonia to Gettysburg. You could not get lost. And when you think about it, as uh, Craig has pointed out, it is the only underground, actually underground railroad, and we have it here in South Central Pennsylvania. And it leads straight from a Thaddeus Stevens property to another Thaddeus Stevens property. Unfortunately, um, the folks who um, are administering this, at least not, not yet to my knowledge, are not eager to uh, jump on the story of the Underground Railroad and, and how that house for, it may have been Lee's headquarters for a day or two, but it was an Underground Railroad station for 30, 40 years. Um, so hopefully we can change that and, and get some um, more, uh, a broader span of history to be told in, in Gettysburg, um, particularly with that house and Thaddeus Stevens. But Thaddeus Stevens is not well liked in Gettysburg. He gets run out of the town. Uh, they accuse him of murdering some people, pushing them down the well. Well, there were no bodies at the bottom of the well. Uh, but he got the message and he moves to Lancaster and he becomes the congressman from Lancaster. We'll catch back up with him in a little bit. But he still remains in those positions in Gettysburg, the board of directors of the college and of the bank. So even though he is gone, he still owns that property. Um, his influence there is by, you know, still what keeps the glue of the Underground Railroad in the Gettysburg area running. So from Gettysburg, uh, most Underground Railroads either, either followed the South Mountain or came straight up from Gettysburg to Quaker Valley. Usually they would be passed through Mount Holly Springs uh, to the Boiling Springs area for a good while was Daniel Kaufman. Uh, after Kaufman got outed, they usually directed people a little bit to the north and west, uh, southwest of Carlisle, what is now Dickinson Township, uh, the Morrison and the Woods farms, which lived right next to each other. And from there, sometimes they would even double them back to Shippensburg just to throw people off the track. Uh, and then they would usually, in the night, send them to Harrisburg. There was a friendly toll keeper, keeper at the Camelback Bridge, now the Market Street Bridge, and they would pass them over in wagons concealed by hay. So here are a couple of uh, items. This is, these are actually from Gettysburg. These are from Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania College a fraternity called the Black Ducks, and they use these little um, bookmarkers that have watermarks on them. They're kind of hard to see in this slideshow, but they each have a distinct watermarker, like one might be a watermark of a government building. This one might be a watermark of uh, a building in England. And they use these little bookmarks to indicate to fellow students who were abolitionists uh, where runaway slaves were located for um, guidance during the evening hours. So I want to wrap this up here with the role this area played in the 13th Amendment. So we can talk all day about the Underground Railroad. We can talk all day about the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, the shelling of Carlisle. But what it, was all, uh, the, what it all amounted to was a, con a push for the Constitutional Amendment. Lincoln comes to Gettysburg in November 1863. He gives a very famous speech. And the, Shortly after that speech is given, a, a constitutional amendment is brought up in the Senate in 1864. The 13th Amendment, the abolition of slavery. Passes the Senate, goes to the House, gets shot down. In January 1865, it's coming back up again. We had an election here. Um, we had in 1862, we had Edward McPherson, who owns the famous McPherson farm on the Gettysburg battlefield, and he was our congressman close friend of Thaddeus Stevens, he gets voted out of office. But Thaddeus Stevens keeps his friends, takes care, of, takes care of them, so he makes him the clerk of the house. He records the votes as they're coming in. Then the man who defeated McPherson is named Archibald McAllister. He was born and raised at a place called Fort Hunter, which is just north of Harrisburg on the East Shore. One of the last surviving slave plantations, he was raised on a plantation that was worked by African-American slaves, and then later by free African-Americans. So Archibald McAllister is an opponent of Abraham Lincoln. He's of the Democratic Party. Lincoln is a Republican. And he votes no in the first vote of the 13th Amendment. But when it comes back up in January 1865, he initially abstains. Then he changes his vote to yes. And his vote is one of the deciding votes for the 13th Amendment. So it was the congressman who was born just north of Harrisburg, who represented this general area in, as a congressman, who makes the deciding vote 
The deciding vote is recorded by the former congressman from Gettysburg, and the whole thing was started by Thaddeus Stevens, who had deep roots in this area. So it is very easy to say that the 13th Amendment might not have been uh, realized if it hadn't been for a lot of key players in the abolitionist movement in this area. Uh, to finish, I'll <coughs> uh, give you the story briefly of Lydia Hamilton Smith, who was a close associate of Thaddeus Stevens. She managed a lot of his business affairs, like Caledonia Iron Furnace, uh, when he was in, in Washington. She was also in Washington a lot uh, as his congressional aide. Here's a portrait of her. Um, she was triracial. She was uh, part African American, part uh, white, and also part Native American. Uh, she was born actually just at a tavern called Russell Tavern, which is on the road uh, between Gettysburg and Carlisle. And this photo of her is taken in 1863. And you can see the patriotism. She is going to Philadelphia for her two sons to enlist in the United States Colored Troops. Uh, the bayonets outside, the American Eagle, uh, the American flag. Here is her mother. Uh, this is a really rare little locket dog areotype that was likely taken in the early, 18, early 1850s, late 1840s. And this is her mother. And you can just, uh, this was a woman who was likely born to slavery in this area in the 1780s. So you can see how it ran full course from a woman who was born to slavery to her daughter who was born free and ends up working for one of the, you know, and she was very instrumental herself um, in policy and helping Thaddeus Stevens kind of formulate some of these policies. And then finally, this is a bookmark that Lydia Hamilton Smith, um, whether she personally wove it, we don't know, but this was one of her personal objects that she used uh, every day. So I thank you very much, and please let me know if you have any questions.